coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. We're celebrating science. It's episode 100. We've got cupcakes, almost champagne, and a Mentos Coke fountain. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki. Episode number 100 recorded on Thursday, June 16th, 2011. Party like it's episode 100. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, or TV, iPad, or iPhone instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Kiki. I'm in Petaluma. This is amazing. IRL in real life. I actually made it made it off of the Skype Skype vidcaster, and I'm into the, the cottage. You know, one last time, maybe before the move into the new studio. But anyway, the reason for my being here is that it's my 100th episode. I'm very excited about this, and so we're having a science party. I've invited some of my favorite science people from the from the area and beyond who are doing incredibly cool stuff in in science and celebrating science every single day. And hopefully, we'll have a great conversation about what it is to celebrate science, the stuff that these people are doing, and um, we'll we'll learn how we can incorporate fun and science into our everyday lives, and maybe at the same time eat a cupcake, science cupcakes, you know. Um, so, yes, I brought some hors d'oeuvres. I brought little, ti- little science cupcakes. I brought some because it's all the chemistry of cooking, of course, that we're celebrating with that. Additionally, I brought some sparkling beverage, which, as we all know, is a super saturated solution with uh, carbon dioxide, <laughs> more chemistry and science. And then I got into some really fun stuff. Lots of junk food that reminds me of science. I don't know why. Nuclear warheads, maybe? Possibly? Warheads? Warheads. Um, what else do I have in the bag here? Crinkle, crinkle, crinkle. I like those. They say extreme sour hard candy. Sour crawly worms. Those are delicious. Willy Wonka f- uh, style, we have the everlasting gobstopper. And... Nerds, as as I love to be called, um, and finally just regular old, regular old gummy worms, and then for some playtime toys for people here in the studio if they're interested, I brought some marshmallows that can be used as little hydrogen atoms, and some colored large marshmallow stars that can be used maybe as carbon atoms or whatever else, and some toothpicks. So if people want to make um, you know, atomic models while we're doing the show, feel free. We're going to have a little bit of fun. We've also got a lot of people from the Twit, from the Twit family outside with uh, Coke and Mentos at the ready to make a fountain. So we've got such a show ready for today. I hope you guys are all very excited. So uh, without any further ado, let me tell you who the guests are. The guests are Kishore Hari. In 2007, he founded Down to a Science, a San Francisco-based science cafe to create social dialogues fueled by scientific research. Building on its successes, Kishore started BayAreaScience.org, a web portal to all of the various science institutions and events all around the Bay Area. Kishore has a BS in chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. In 2002, he co-founded Superior Adsorbance, Inc., an environmental services company specializing in heavy metal remediation from air, soil, and water. And now Kishore is the coordinator for the Bay Area Science Festival that's going to take place in the Bay Area this fall. Moving on, we also have Darlene (laughs) Cavalier. She's an advocate for the super science literacy, a writer and an entrepreneur. She's uh, heading home from Stanford right now because she's been doing some top secret science stuff uh, with people in Stanford this week. She's the founder of Science Cheerleader. You can find her on Twitter as SciCheer. 
she uh, has this science cheerleader as a blog that promotes science in popular culture and plays on her former position as a cheerleader for the Philadelphia 76ers basketball team. She's also the co-founder of Science for Citizens. It's an online portal that aggregates citizen science projects and enlists the help of volunteers to work on the projects. She's also an advisor and contributor to Dis Discover Magazine and has was also on the steering committee of Science Debate 2008 um, and... And got got Senators McCain and Obama, Obama to debate the top 14 science questions facing America. So she's very heavily involved. And Brian Mallow. Da -da -da, you, all, you can probably sum me up in just two words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a couple more than two, actually. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. You might all know Brian from his stint subbing for me here on the show while I was on maternity leave. But if not, he's also known as... I think you, you've called yourself this, the Earth's premier science comedian. Yeah, self-proclaimed. Yes. Brian has appeared on The Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, has performed for the National Institute of Stand Standards and Technology, JPL, the American Chemical Society, Scholastic Library Publishing, the National Association of Science Writers, a uh, bunch of other places, Apple, Dell, Microsoft. He is currently a freelance science correspondent, writing and appearing in science video essays for Time Magazine's website, and he likes to photograph insects. I do. That's right. <laughs> Bug, <Thank> porn. <laughs> Bug porn. Bug porn. Exactly. Like you left it open that you're not the premier science comedian in the universe. <laughs> no. Other that, I think that would be overstepping. That, might... that would be a little arrogant on my part. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to move move forward really quickly. Thank you guys all for joining me today. Quick, quick round of science headlines, right, before we have our Ooh. really great discussion. First, solar researchers reported that this solar cycle might be headed for a drop in the number of sunspots, which would mean lower overall solar activity, which means less sunshine for the planet Earth and maybe less warming. But I don't, maybe not. There's a little bit of conversation going on about that, so think about that. Scientists turned a living kidney cell into a laser using green fluorescing protein, which comes from a jellyfish. More stuff to think about. The Large Hadron Collider has delivered one inverse femtobarn of collision events. In case you were wondering, that's a heck of a lot of data. MIT researchers showed that robotic cars will be able to predict a human driver's moves. This is going to be important for the future of robotic cars on human-populated roads, as we had a conversation about that in a, more, in a recent show. Uh, Japanese whalers reported measuring radioactive cesium in two mink whales. And while not caught near the Fukushima nu nuclear plants, uh, that's where the radioactivity is thought to originate. Problems in the oceans there. And finally, a small study of Midwestern teenagers' brains suggested that teen brains might hold the key to a song's failure. 90% of the songs that don't get the teen brain excited becomes, become flops. Pretty interesting news this week, I think. Is that a, is that a It's like 90% of the songs that don't capture their imagination don't sell. Yes. Mm. Don't, it's, it's, it, but it's not the... There's, it's there's, there's, there's more discussion brain, about it. It's yeah. about the brain. It's the brain being excited, not necessarily their personality person being exciting, so excited. So the rating has but nothing to do with Then there's songs that really attack you in the booty. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> is this why I didn't like that Friday song by... <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Yeah, the question is whether or not this is whether this has anything to do with the popularity of the song Friday. Friday, <laughs> Friday. But anyway, I'm sure there's some science to explain that. I think it's time to go outside. We have this show going off to a blast with a bunch of Coke and Mentos fountains. The whole Twit family is lined up outside and they're ready to to <laughs> test the Coke Mento fountain phenomenon. Is it going to spell out Dr. Kiki or something? Yeah, I think it should, right? <laughs> so everybody's got their Mentos lined up over the top of their, uh, their soda bottles. And, of course, their non-sugared soda. And they're ready to go whenever they want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a twisted ankle. <laughs> That's the first injury I've ever seen on a Coke Mentos. Experiment. Right. Oh, he's taking a drink. I don't recommend taking a drink. Oh. 
Uh, it, because all the carbon dioxide is now gone out of the really? yeah. uh, out of solution. So now all you're left with is um, is the ingredients. <laughs> so, so it's it's all the nutrition without any of the joy. <laughs> I and, and the nutrition is questionable. It's phosphoric acid and caramel food coloring and um, not even real sugar right. in this in Not this even case. real Coke. It's Diet Coke. I just read something. I guess we all know that, that Coke originally did have cocaine in it. Um, something I didn't know is like it when it, when it, when it came out, there were a lot of um, carbonated beverages. There, this effervescent. There was this belief that they, they would... Um, that effervescent bubbly water was good for your health in some way. And so a lot of these came out. And apparently Dr. Pepper was already out, and it claimed to be good for uh, male impotence, I think, from That's Dr. Pepper. Yeah. Fascinating. But when Coke came out, it actually could make claims and uh, live up to the promotion because it had cocaine in it. So it's like it actually had a, quite a stimulating effect. Small amount of Coke. But. Now it's just caffeine. Yeah. Now, yeah, now it's just the caffeine or the, like or if the you're even going days. for an energy drink, it's the taurine or the guarana or whatever else. So I'm going to actually taste the mm. nutritional aspect of this to see. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, you know what really makes this work? It's pretty flat, thing? actually. <laughs> you know what really flat. makes this work? It's the 80 degree temperature of, oh, it's uh, been of, the, the, of the solution. Um, what about the wow. mentos? And, and just a hint of mint. <laughs> just the, like just the tiniest fleck of mint that makes you think, wow, I should not be drinking this. Yeah. <laughs> Minty diet Coke Zero. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to going to uh, drink it again. I think I'll I've I've experienced the the lack of carbonation. <gasps> oh, that was fun. Re usually, you have to reach into the back of your fridge for something like that. <laughs> exactly, which I've done accidentally many times. The, but the fun thing I think about the Mentos and Coke fountain the phenomenon here there is actually science behind it that you know it's not just some random thing that happens um the super saturation of the soda itself uh allows for there there's too much there's more than enough carbon dioxide in the soda right then you add the mentos and the mentos have this kind of rough mottled surface which uh, allow for what are called nucleation points. And these are points where little gas bubbles of carbon dioxide can form on the surface of the Mentos. And there's something about the combination of Mentos with its highly mottled rough surface and the supersaturation of the soda that makes quite a fountain effect. And you've probably seen stuff like this happen with root beer floats, you know, by the poolside when you're a summertime and when you're a kid, you know, the, the frothiness of that beverage, that all has to do with the same phenomenon, yeah. supersaturation and nucleation. I believe the only way we're going to get to Mars is with new propulsion systems, perhaps based on Mentos and Diet Coke. Maybe in 50 years, no one will drink <laughs> Diet Coke or eat Mentos, but we'll still have them because... Yeah, and we probably <laughs> shouldn't anyway, <Yeah>. but... <laughs> So let's move into the discussion. I think that was a great way to get to get the party started. We're having having a great time. Thank you, everybody in the Twit family. I hope you all had a good time outside putting it all. Ayaz had the idea. Thank you very much for coming up with the idea, Ayaz. Yeah, thank you. Yes, inspired, inspired fountain time. Um, so is Darlene still there? She's still on the I'm phone. still here. You're still here. Yay. Are... Excellent. So you, Darlene has no idea what's going on. We've just got her on the phone. It sounds very excited. I, was, I, I need to know what happened to the person who twisted their ankle. I know. <laughs> I, think, I think she's all right. I think it was ended up just being okay. a piece of gravel in the, in the, in the flip-flop as opposed to okay. a twisted ankle, I hope. No scientists were harmed in the making of this episode. Yes. <laughs> Yet. 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 It's still Yet. early. It's still, there's still time. Um, so, Darlene, can you tell us tell us a bit about Science Cheerleader and also and from there, Science for Citizens? What are you doing to help people engage more with science in, in, in the everyday? Sure. First, thank you for having me on the show. And I'm so excited to be part of your celebration. Very thrilling. I wish I was there. I think I gained about five pounds just listening to what you guys are ready to eat. <laughs> <laughs> but it's <that's> delicious. Um, <laughs> So uh, 
really what I do is look for um, ways to point people to different on-ramps where they can get involved in science research, um, learn about cool things happening in science, and or eventually get involved in science policy topics. And it was a very personal um, personal passion of mine. After working at Discover for about 10 years, I went to graduate school to really learn more about people like me, so untrained in the sciences and yet very you know, interested in becoming more a part, becoming a bigger part of science. And believe it or not, Kiki, I have to sign off on a, not on a call, but just on a credit card. <laughs> we see we just pulled up to the airport, so I found this back. That's what that was about. Sorry, guys. Um, and in the process of going to graduate school, trying to find my place in the world, um, I learned about these remarkable people known as citizen scientists. So these are people who, you know, volunteer to help researchers accomplish a variety of tasks. Um, and they were somewhat fragmented. And I only recognized that they were fragmented in their um, even just their, their presence on the web, for example, because I had to write a capstone paper about the, um, the general idea of getting lots and lots of people excited about science, bringing them up to some certain uh, level of science literacy, um, getting them involved in citizen science projects, and then what would happen if we move them to the next step, which would be getting involved in policy conversations. So in my attempt to sort of catalog the field of citizen science, I started a uh, science cheerleader and just started keeping notes of different projects that were out there and asked the public that if they had a project, if they could let me know about it, that would be great, and made the, the, the project finder searchable so that people coming to the blog can learn about projects that they can get involved in, too. Um, not too long after that, um, the, the project finder spawned its own website. And I am just leaving a tip here with 20% of 53. <laughs> you just need to um, submit the audio <laughs> instead of uh, submitting any receipts. <laughs> I got it. Here we go. If I could just have a copy, please. Is, is this the um, first episode of your show that's the first episode that's come from, live from a taxi? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think so. That's right. Um, so this on its own website, and that is called scienceforcitizens.net, and it has, oh, I don't know, somewhere between four and 500 projects that are in there now, um, with more being added each week. Um, and we're just adding a couple of functionalities to make it even easier to reach out to a broader audience, thank you, and connect them to activities that align with their, um, their preferences. So that could be anything from wanting to get in projects that are only taking place in San Francisco area. Or it, it might be, um, you know, exclusively online projects they can do, you know, in the middle of the night or as long as they, as often as they'd like to. Um, so back to Science Cheerleader a bit. In the attempt to get as many people as possible jazzed about science, or at least to feel that they have a connection to science, that there's a place for them, even if they weren't trained in science. Um, I did an activity with... George Mason University, and one of the professors there, um, Jim Trafell, writes a lot about adult science literacy. One of the books that I read of his called Why Science had what I felt is one of the best approaches to explaining, uh, explaining as best one could what science literacy is, why it's important, um, why we as adults should be science literate, and went so far as to take, take the bold step of saying, here's 18 things you should know. Start with these 18 points. If you're going to tell somebody they should be science literate, give them some direction. And I liked, I liked that, um, that uh, kind of topic area that he was going after, not just saying it's good to be, but here's how to do it. Yeah. Um, so he looks at these as 18 points that create a framework for which other new pieces of information should be able to fit in there. So uh, we took his 18 points, we being me, myself, and I, <laughs> um, met with the professors and, you know, how risk averse are you? And would you be open to kind of bringing these 18 points to life by working with the um, Philadelphia 76ers cheerleader? And as you had mentioned in your um, introduction, that was a team that I had cheered for back in the early 90s. So he said, absolutely, let's give it a shot. It's, it's not, how can it hurt? Um, so we had each one, zero budget, had each one of the 76ers cheerleaders rattle off one of these 
topics that he had. And it was, you know, it was ridiculous, and it was just an experiment. Um, the universe is regular and predictable. Yay! And then he would blog about what that meant, why it was his number one thing that you should learn, and how it fits into this larger framework. And then he created an online quiz at the end of this. So um, mm -hmm. the remarkable output to that was in the first week that it was launched, through one press release that George Mason University did, um, we had more than 20,000 people took that quiz. And you have to watch the videos to get to the quiz. And we know that it's an audience that I, in particular, wanted to reach because it was featured on Fox National Headline News. And ironically, the same day it was featured on the Chronicle of Higher Education. So it's two totally different takes on the same story. Um, but I learned a lot from that little experiment. One, um, it turns out that I would have uh, more NFL and NBA cheerleaders emailing me saying, hey, I just saw what you did online. Let me join the cause. You know, I'm a cheerleader for the Redskins, and I'm also, you know, getting my chemical engineering degree. Nice. Uh, it never dawned on me that there might be professional cheerleaders who were who are scientists and engineers. So uh, the whole approach of using cheerleaders took on uh, a different path once I learned of how many there were and how unbelievably effective they are. Especially when I was going after, you know, the bar group, the Fox National News group. It turns out these women obviously get that attention. Um, they can easily get national and international media attention, but it's little girls that they relate to and resonate with the best. And I've witnessed this time after time again. It's the three to four million little girls who are cheerleaders in the United States who feel a connection to the science cheerleaders. So using them as representatives of what it looks like to be a scientist or an engineer or what that career, you know, what, what it takes to be a scientist and engineer um, approach through using cheerleading as a mechanism, something that directly relates to them, has proven to be pretty successful. I mean, we're trying our best to kind of measure the outcome. It's relatively new. We only launched that aspect um, in October at the USA Science and Engineering Festival. Um, we've done some fun things. You know, there's, we are not risk averse, so we try out wild and crazy things and we see what works and what resonates with people. And yeah. if it works, we we look for additional collaborators to make it even much bigger and broader than we can. For example, we just did a uh, partnership with the National Science Foundation, the NFL, and NBC Sports to um, put out a series that just won an Emmy um, titled The Science of NFL Football. Awesome. Um, and we'll keep looking for fun opportunities like that. But, but there's no excuse any longer for somebody to say, I don't feel connected to science. Why do I need to learn this stuff? What good is it for me? And, uh, you know, there's nothing I could do. Because we have four to five hundred examples at, over at Science for Citizens that make it very easy. No matter, you know, just go count fireflies in your backyard, tell us about it, um, and you're connected to science in that very low barrier to entry. Yeah, the uh, all the things that you're doing, just uh, every time, every, when, when I found you online several years ago, we were starting out with the science cheerleader stuff, and it just really resonated with me personally. I was a cheerleader. Right. Oh. Full, full, uh, full d disclosure here. I was a cheerleader in high school. Me too. Yes, Brian. No, no. you wore that <laughs> cute little skirt. <laughs> but, I just wanted to. But I remember not really, not really connecting well with the rest of the cheerleading squad because they were busy talking about the latest diet or the cutest outfit, and I was busy huh? studying or I was interested in you know science project or you know some other. Uh -huh other aspect of, of education and it's just to look back at that and if I if at that time I had seen uh, NFL cheerleaders or other other people actually doing science and being a cheerleader professionally you know it might it might have had a big impact on me as to you know I mean obviously I've ended up okay but <laughs> you know there are probably a lot of other little girls who are cheerleaders who it what you're doing will definitely affect what they're doing. And maybe in, after the football game on Friday nights, they'll, you know, go home so that Saturday they can go on a bird watching trip to count birds or something. That's right. We're using the cheerleaders in that regard too, to get the, you know, get the word out about these citizen science activities. So when they're out in public, they can point people to those different activities, letting, you know, kids know too. If, don't feel pressured to be a scientist or an engineer, but we're here to tell you, even if you, if you do, you don't have to choose between your favorite passion and what you want to do with your life. So in this case, science and, and cheerleading. But even if you don't want to grow up to become a scientist, there are all of these other ways that you can embrace science and get involved in ways that are meaningful 
and important to society. First of all, who doesn't want to grow up to not be a scientist <laughs> or engineer? <laughs> <laughs> But I've seen, I've seen the cheerleaders firsthand um, uh, a, a couple times now, and it's always amazing how uh, how it doesn't resonate at all with me. And I was like, I don't understand this. I was never into sort of cheerleading or anything surprising, uh -huh. I know. Uh, <laughs> but it's amazing to see the, the impact around a wide crowd. It attracts so much attention. And uh, just uh, the level yeah. of, uh, of, of sweetness of seeing all these little... Uh, girls come up to these women um, it is uh, it's just amazing uh, Darlene and then all the men of all ages around the periphery <laughs> <laughs> you had to go there family show Brian <laughs> sure thank you for sharing that because um, as I said that was not the intended goal for me it's still surprising when I witnessed that because it just wasn't what I set out to do you know everything I did was geared towards towards adults. And to watch that ramification happen has been one of the most satisfying experiences of my professional career, for sure. Absolutely. Now, Kishore, what, you, what, what you're talking about also brings to mind kind of what the angle you take on getting people interested in science. And while what Darlene's work has done is bring out the um, an ability to get young girls maybe more interested in the sciences, find an angle to get uh, young people interested, mm -hmm. You've been focused on getting adults interested. Tell me a bit about that. Well, uh, honestly, I uh, it all started out as a happenstance. I was at a scientific conference, and uh, I was really unhappy with my job. I think that probably resonates with a lot of people right now. <laughs> and uh, I, I stumbled across this flyer that said science cafes on it. And this was at the big AAAS meeting back in 2007. I was like, I don't know what a science cafe is, but they're host hosting a happy hour at a bar two blocks from my apartment. And I was willing to go two blocks from my apartment <laughs> to see what a science cafe was. And uh, I met this, um, this man, Ben Weehy, who was working for WGBH at the time. And he said, yeah, science cafes are great, but let's just talk about science over beers. And I was like, oh. I like doing that. That's pretty much like some of my best memories from school was doing that with my friends. Yeah. And after a couple hours, I was like, oh, yeah, so what's a science cafe? And he's like, uh, you just kind of went through one. You should start one. And a couple months later, I had started one that was really uh, uh, the focus was more about bringing a, a scientist in direct connection to an audience and just talking to each other as if you're around a dinner table. Um, really just meeting each other and just having a conversation. Because to me, science was always social. And somewhere along the lines, we sort of forgot about that uh, when it came to interacting with certain audiences. Mm -hmm. So that just became an incredible passion project of mine and opening up more and more avenues for all of these scientists and engineers just to talk to each other as as human beings. I know it's a crazy concept. Scientists are humans too. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm kind of fascinated. One thing I noticed at AAAS, I went for the first time this year in February, and I thought this was really interesting. I think at a lot of types of conferences in other businesses and industries, there's some, obviously there's talk about the industry, but then it's not necessarily everyone's passion. But at AAAS, the people are not only there, they're really there for the science. And it's not just... Um, you can tell by the level of passion that all, almost all the conversations are about science and about well, did you see this and did you go see so-and-so speak or did you see that panel? And it just continues for the entire week. Everyone loves it so much. It's not just their job. It's their passion. And that's what, what I want to showcase more than anything else is, is bring that sort of natural enthusiasm out into a more public spectacle because there is a buzz that builds at these conferences. There's so much talking happening in, in Corners. And uh, so the uh, where this whole science cafe movement led me was to become director of the first ever Bay Area Science Festival, which is a hundred events over ten days. It's October 29th to November 6th of this year, and the whole idea is is again really generating that buzz. Like, uh, and what always gets me is this whole notion of we have arts festivals, music festivals. Uh, lots of food festivals with terrible corn dogs and, mm -hmm. and cotton candy, but we don't. Why not a science festival? Right, why and not? with science, mm -hmm. we should have the best corn dogs ever. Well, ones that can <laughs> science stand up corn to, dogs. <laughs> ones that can stand up to zero g at least. Yeah, <laughs> zero g corn dog. And That's many, my and many band. empirical tests. Oh, of course. Yes, rigorously, rigorously tested, tested peer-reviewed corn, corn dogs. dogs. Uh, but. <laughs> 
I, citizen science projects. I hear them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to me, that's the fun. I mean, when I go think about what I'm going to do uh, this weekend with my family, we're we're going to a festival this weekend. Why not? If there's a science festival, why not go to something like? What kind that? of festival are you going to? I'm going to a beer festival. <laughs> <laughs> All right, which is fermentation science in action. Yes. You can just think of it that way. I need to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, but before we go, we have a toast from one of our listeners. So everybody, if you'd like to raise your glass and we'll uh, go to this toast from Pamela. In just a second. <laughs> Yay! Congratulations. Congratulations on 100 episodes of the Dr. Kiki Science Hour. Here's to 100 more. Thank you, Pamela. Yay, Pamela. Thank you. <laughs> I'm drinking. There's root people in the background. I'm not drinking alcohol on the job, really. So anyway, on to the word from our sponsor. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means that you save time, money, and hassle, all things that are very important to you, I'm sure. There are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with, with Netflix. First, you can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac or PC or iPad. If you didn't know, there's actually an iPad app that you might enjoy. Second, you can watch on your iPhone and some Android phones too. It's not all I, I, I around here. Um, three, if you have a gaming console, an Xbox, P 360, PS3, Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your television set. And fourth, if you're not a gamer, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any devices uh, like a Roku box uh, with an, or an Apple TV box. They're inexpensive and they're quite easy to use. With Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of the devices, and you can begin watching a movie or show on one device. And then if you have to stop for some reason and go someplace else, you can finish that movie or show on a different device, which is pretty cool. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want any time you want, and you can cancel at any time. So why don't you try Netflix right now today for 30 days for free? You can go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for the free trial. It's netflix, N-E-T-F-L-I-X dot com forward slash twit, T-W-I-T. We thank Netflix for their support of Twit and Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, and we hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. And back to the show, back to the celebration, 100 episodes. We have another toast that was sent in by Alan. This one was just a piece of toast. Just a piece of toast, exactly. It's a little longer, but uh, it's a nice a bit toast. Dry. <laughs> <laughs> a bit dry. I'm trying to butter you up. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube no loading. There we go. Sometimes YouTube is uh, slows. Hello, Dr. Geek and the Science Hour. Mm, uh, I really don't know what to say. It's like almost six. 7 p.m. over here. I'm really tired all day in school, so it's gonna. I wrote down what I wanted to say for your 100th episode. So, first of all, it's happy 100th episode for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Um, I have to say, I enjoy very much your show, it's pretty cool. Um, every, every episode, there's always something new to say and learn, and, and it's good. The conversation is. And the, and the subjects that you give is they're pretty interesting, and I mean like, the internet meets science show of yours. It's pretty cool. And well, I mean one of the things that your your show actually uh, is awesome. In my opinion is that everyone everybody can participate, and it makes it uh, a good good enjoyable hour. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kiki and and the entire crew for giving us uh, every Friday. Uh, a show, a show like yours, and well, I hope there's more than a hundred ep episodes to come in the future, and just keep it up. And we hope to keep it up. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Mm. He's giving you a lot more work. Yay, Another hundred episodes. Another, yeah. I know it. Okay. Immediately, stat, go. <laughs> 
I don't know. Is there a hundred more episodes worth of stuff to discuss out there? In science? In science? <laughs> I think there are, and I hope, I hope to keep at it for a very long time. Maybe more than a hundred more episodes, right? Right. Go big. Go, or go home, right? <laughs> anyway, Brian, <laughs> we've been talking about Keyshore. Behind his back. Behind his, no, about what Keyshore does, what Darlene does. Now tell us about your angle on getting people interested in science and, and how you got your start. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I didn't start out to get people interested in science. I happen to be interested in science, and I found myself doing stand-up comedy. And if you saw me, even before I called myself a science comedian, it was pretty obvious that I was kind of science geeky, tendency towards science and science fiction references and stuff. Um, once I started, once I discovered that... Uh, that I should call, well, realize I should go with the name Science Comedian, and I found the domain was available, which was just a few, several years ago when I was like, the fact that sciencecomedian.com was available, like that was either a really good sign or a really bad sign that 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 that's a good domain right. or not. But um, dot net was taken for some reason. <laughs> right, I don't know why dot 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 info wasn't available. But um, uh, since I've been doing this, I do feel more of an obligation and an interest in, in getting people into Because I love science. So just mm -hmm. off stage, I just, in general, in my life, I like to. In fact, last night, I did a little show in San Francisco uh, at a cafe, the Bazaar Cafe in the mm -hmm. outer Richmond or around 21st Avenue in California. And it was their uh, one-year anniversary show, actually. And I headlined it. And so a bunch of local comics went on. And the timing was such that I knew there was going to be an ISS passing at 9.45 last night. The space station was going overhead. So at the end of my set, I had everyone pour out of the cafe and we watched the ISS go overhead. That's and great. a lot of them, none of them had seen it before. Yep. Um, some of them were really unaware. What is it we're seeing? They didn't know. And um, I did this once before at a friend of mine's birthday party at a bar, had everyone come outside. And that night I knew... The, the the orbit of the ISS changes as to where like, uh, it it doesn't uh, it doesn't coincide exactly with the rotation of the Earth, so mm -hmm. that it's always it's changing. So um, it happened that other night that an hour and a half later was going to a second pass over San Francisco was happening. That's not always the case. Um, no, it's and that not. really blew people away that time when they came out and they're like, now that's not the same one. And I'm like, yes, in the past hour and a half while we were in there drinking, the uh, the space station went around the earth an entire time at 17,000 miles an hour. And and that one was really exciting. We we that's took neat. photos and stuff. And last night, a few people, they'd never seen it. And, they didn't, and it's just a point of light going across the sky. But you know that it's this giant space station and there's humans in it. There's some Russian guy in there right now. <laughs> <Yes>. Right. <laughs> there's actually a website. And if you want to follow it on Twitter, uh, twist, yeah. twist, T-W-I-S-S-T-13. It's yeah. kind of an odd, odd, odd Twitter name, but that's the account that you can follow, and it tells you when the space station is going to be going overhead for where you are. Right. So it's localized to you. I get those, and sometimes that's a reminder for me. And then I go to another site. It's heavensabove.com, mm -hmm. and it's heavens-above.com. And it has really detailed stuff, and you can put in your precise coordinates, like like mm -hmm. where you live. And um, I, I like what they, they give a really detailed breakdown of the upcoming passes. And they also cover a bunch of other, yeah, like um, it's hard to see, but it'll show you where it says satellites. Um, the ISS is one of them, 10, 10 day predictions for the ISS. But look, I'm curious about that one. It'll also show, if you go back to that, that other page, there's a list of some other things. It says NanoSail D and Genesis 1 and 2. It's like there's, there are other things in orbit that you can possibly catch a glimpse of. Yeah, I, I, got, I had fun with the space station at the holidays telling my uh, little nephews that it was um, Santa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's a fun site. I, I was real. I wanted to be able to tell the people last night how many people were on board the station. I didn't know because that com it varies completely. Yeah, it depends. So on the turns time. out there's only three on board right now. And you know how I found out? There's a site called it, the domain is how many people are in space right now dot com, and that's all it does is it tells you. And it's right now it's and that you domain is available too. I, can you believe it? <laughs> I'm thinking I should get how many people are in space now. Cut out the word right, makes it a little long. Um, so, like, right there, yeah, it's like, it's a very simple domain. Three people are in space right now. 
about a Not month ago, many. I was at the Philadelphia Science Festival, and the first African American in space, Guy Bluford, was giving a talk, and it was all it was returning to the neighborhood he grew up in, and there was two to three hundred African American kids in the room, and it was this emotional, really uplifting moment where he was talking about what it takes to actually rise out of some uh, yeah. troubled situations, and then he talked about the ISS, and we walked outside, and he's like. Yeah, there it is, up in the sky. And all yeah. these kids, like, at simultaneously look up at the sky. It was just a ma – it's one of those really simple, magical moments that you just look up. Yeah. Same it's, thing with the moon the past couple nights. There's been a great, bright, full moon the past couple nights. Full moon, and, and also not, not here, but there's been a, a lunar eclipse occurring mm – -hmm. A total lunar eclipse, I think, oh. and other, other not on this continent, but other places. Right. Yesterday on Google, they made the Google Doodle had a little moon animation. Mm -hmm. And if you click the logo, what it, what, it, what it always does is it pulls up a search result uh, page that's relevant. And so there were about lunar eclipse, all these results. And I did a screen cap. Um, I stuck this on sciencecomedian.com uh, in my blog because one of the ones listed was Wikipedia. I clicked the blog, um, mm. and it says uh, it was a definition of a lunar eclipse that was way, way, way off. It says a lunar eclipse is when the moon turns black and explodes, releasing a poisonous <laughs> gas, killing all humanity. <laughs> and so what this was, this was... Uh, that's not what it happened. It already no wasn't on Wikipedia, but it was cached. So it was showing in the Google results, and I did a screen cap to grab this because this was Wikipedia's. De somebody snuck in this definition, and within a couple hours, it was gone. But it had been cached for a little while and was showing up on that search results page. <laughs> I just have to know for, do you think, I mean, all these things, the space station, the lunar eclipse, these are things that, as you said, they're simple. They're easy to grab people's attention, to use to grab people's attention. Is that the trick? Do we, does, does it need to be simple? I, I don't think there's a trick at the end of the day. Uh, I, I believe in sort of the universality of, of uh, humans just talking to each other. I mean, if you want to call that a trick, uh, it's it's a it's a it's a big charade. Yeah, people talking to each other and actually enjoying each other's company mm -hmm. without a real hidden agenda. That's that's sort of the connecting point to all of this. Is really there's human to human interaction, and the ISS is a great vehicle for that interaction to happen, and it really inspires the wonder. But it's really about Brian taking a group of people out of a bar and saying, "Hey, look up." Yeah. Uh, so at the if you want to call that a trick, I mean, it got me a wife that trick. So. <laughs> How exactly? What was that story? Yeah. No, Darlene, do you do you agree with Kishore? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the context. I definitely do agree with him. But there are opportunities to take it a couple steps further, and you may have mentioned some of this when I was just checking in. But um, the idea that so much of NASA's funding has been cut, and how that affects you know our ability to perhaps never see this um, again, or 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 how NASA is adapting to ways. Um, that they can get astronauts up to the International Space Station by, you know, using private firms in the future. I don't know, it opens up opportunities for as deep as a conversation as I think your audience would want to get. And, uh, and the trick or the bait, um, you know, has to be there in order to have people gravitate over to whatever the topic is going to be. Brian? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think you do. The, the point I think you were making, though, is that some topics are not as easy to embrace people with. And if you start to get into something really esoteric and anything in genetics or, um, you know, science obviously can get very technical. And it, it, it starts to not become humans talking to each other. They start sure. to think that person is not of my species. Um, <laughs> what is he talking about? That was no language I'm familiar with. Um, it is a tougher sell in space. Is, this is pretty easy. But that's a it common is. thread between the three of us. I mean, Darlene uses uh, this notion of cheerleading. Right. And I use humor, and I use the notion of a, of a festival. And beer. And, <laughs> speaking of how I ended up being married. But uh, <laughs> the, the whole point is, like, we're using just really common elements that have existed for years. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and that people can automatically relate to and then elevating that in some way uh, to really just create engagement. And I think that's a, a great place to start. But I, I also agree, Darlene, this isn't uh, – there's next steps to take yeah. it further. 
Um, I like a lot of the science, the citizen science projects. And one I saw that's coming up in a day or two that she was just plugging, um, it was on scienceforcitizens.net, um, mm-hmm. was about measuring. It's something that they want people to do uh, in a couple days that involves measuring uh, the albedo uh, of mm-hmm. different points on the earth. And it just involves you taking a, pe- a photo of a piece of white paper, right, Darlene? Do you know what I'm talking about? That's exactly right, yep. Yeah, that's a perfect example of projects where I had mentioned earlier that there just is no excuse anymore for people to say, well, there's, there's nothing for me. Um, that's the simplest thing you can do. Take a picture of a piece of white paper. Don't use your flash. Um, try not to do it in the rain. Yeah. And you can just, even if you're not getting involved in that project, just reading the two-paragraph description of the scientific merit involved in that project um, gives you, it enlightens you. And start, you start to understand how these little pieces together in a bigger way. There's so many examples of those. Um, you know, something as simple as counting fireflies. Well, as you're signing up for that project, if you want to get involved in that project, that researcher asks very specific questions that help you start to think as a scientist. So you may have your own reason for, think- for um, uh, explaining why there aren't as many fireflies around as there were. And this, that might not be relevant to West Coast listeners, because as I understand it, fireflies aren't on the West Coast necessarily, nope. um, but on the East Coast, they're a big deal, and if you listen to adults, you'll hear them say, where are all the fireflies? It must be global warming. Well, getting involved in a firefly watch project, some of the questions that that researcher will ask you as you're filling out the form is, you know, is there a man-made water supply around you? Is there artificial lighting? Do they spray for bugs? Those are questions that are all part of the equation, and even just in the process of asking you to think about those questions. Um, suddenly, maybe it's not just global warming. Maybe it's that you live in an urban area. Just other indications and get, getting people to think more critically um, can go a long way. Yeah. The, uh, one part that I lift, left out of my um, other monologue was that the, the effort to get more people involved in science policy conversations. Um, so we started a group called ECAST, and it's Expert and Citizen Assessment of Science and Technology. And it's a network of science museums led by Boston Museum of Science, um, universities led by um, Arizona State University. Science Cheerleader is involved in kind of just launching this effort, but it's all grounded in house at the Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars in Washington. And the idea here is to get more of the general public um, informed about and also weighing in on matters of emerging technologies before policies are set. So, um, Ryan, you had mentioned that some topics are just so esoteric that they're, it's difficult to get people that you can become interested in them. So one of the things that we're looking to do is find out what those hooks are and use a variety of models. We'll do these pilot tests um, using these different models and these different hooks and these different forms of messaging. And they'll all be evaluated um, by the universities. So in this case, it'll be Arizona State University helping us look at the methodologies and the evaluation of our techniques. The museums play a very important role because they do the outreach. So they use their best practices and their trigger points that have worked in the past to get people to show up to an event, for example. Um, It's a cool thing where you get to be, you not only get to do this fun activity, but then you're actually a, a data point Yes. That's in some in some scientific research pro- in a real research project. It's cool. And, and in a policy research, so this is yeah. different than traditional citizen science. What happens at these events is that we we have people, you know, a variety of stakeholders. They don't even know their stakeholders, but they're important because they bring in their local knowledge. Even if it's something about you know synthetic biology or you know an old topic would have been genetically modified food. They listen to the the scientists. Um, they ask questions. They weigh in. And then there's sort of an, an arbiter of, of sorts who, who drafts this up with Woodrow Wilson Center in policy terms that policymakers and Congress can understand. Like, so here are the concerns. It's almost a form of risk assessment. But again, it's using the general pu- public to um, you know, get involved in these conversations. And that's a great way to enlighten people about you know, emerging areas of technology that are so important to them. And when, when they feel like they're informed enough and they feel like they're actually being valued, so asking them questions because it matters, yeah. Um, I think that I'm, I'm curious to see. The jury is still out. I haven't, we haven't done this long enough to see what the outcomes are going to be. And frankly, if Congress is even going to, you know, utilize any of the materials that we send to them. Uh, but I think the exercise and the, the experiment itself is, 
is a worthy endeavor and it's one that I am really intrigued by. Yeah, and for, for this audience, for the, the viewers of the, the Twit Network especially, um, there are a lot of people interested in technology and emerging technologies, and so for them to become aware of this, it, you know, we mm -hmm. might have a lot more data points for that for that policy project as well so everyone who's watching great. or listening right now you know you can get involved in the ecast um project and maybe have an effect on policy through science exactly. and technology which is i think i think that's when it comes when it when it comes to like end results you know there there are multiple different layers of of what you can go for you can go for just getting somebody interested in asking more questions about the world around them. You can get somebody more interested in, in learning about critical thinking. You can get somebody interested in actually being part of a research project. You can, and then finally, you can also go towards getting involved in a project that will have an impact on the way things are done in our, in this country and maybe internationally even. So they're also, I think that's one of the, the most important things to, to understand is that, you know, all of you and what you do, you, you cover all these these various shades of science in life. And to get out there and to inform people about all the ways they can use science and, and, and act on science every day, I think is, it's great. There's not just one way to do it. Yourself included in that conversation exactly. as well. Exactly. This is, this what? is, yes. Huh? <laughs> what? So I'm going to flip the script. How about you? hundred episodes in, how do you see yourself playing uh, in the, in this field, uh, how do you celebrate science? Yeah, how do I celebrate science? Well, I try and have conversations with as many scientists as possible, and try and bring those conversations to as many people as I can. I want to, you know, I I revel in my role and the the ability. My I, I love my my ability to be able to help communicate and translate some of the science that people do and get it out there so that people can consume it more easily to enjoy it, to, you know, think about it, ponder it, you know, at the end of this show, I always say, I hope this hour made your world a whole lot more interesting because that's what I, that's what I hope to do. So a hundred episodes, I hope that's a hundred hours of more interesting. Absolutely. <laughs> There's a few more hours left in the, in the day. Yeah. So <laughs> here's uh, hoping for another hundred more. Somebody Thank in you. your chat stream said that uh, a couple weeks ago I made fun of them. I you said <laughs> Ryan Mallow made fun of me at a comedy show a couple weeks ago. I'd like to know what that was. <laughs> Making fun of people. Isn't Making that, fun of that's people. That's all part of the, a comedy show, though. That's all part the of science it. Of the comedy. science comedy show, exactly. So we're getting towards the end of the hour. Um, well, we, we are at the end of the four o'clock hour, but we started a little bit late. So I just wanted to open it up to the chat room and get a few um, answers from people out there as how you celebrate science in your life. What do people in the chat room do? Um, there was a, a comment a little bit earlier from from GL Goldizator. He says, stand up for us, Dr. Kiki. We don't need tricks to be interested in science discussion. So you don't need tricks, but what do you do? What's your celebration on a daily basis, everyone out there? <laughs> Hobbit from PA says, this show makes me happy. Thank yeah. you, Hobbit. But I appreciate it. Here's how I celebrated last night. I gave a talk on science and the Simpsons. Right. That's great. I and would love, did, you, did, somebody, did somebody record that talk? I, somebody or, did record that talk, and yeah. it'll be up on the Nerd Night um, website. Uh, but uh, I, as I said at the beginning, I've spent 22 years researching that talk. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the highlight. Every night. Sunday night. <laughs> Every Sunday night, it's in syndication. So, like, yeah. every night. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's just one of those amazing things. As I sort of delved into it, um, there is so much incredible science that happens in that show and in shows all over TV. And uh, it was just an amazing exploration of what they get right and what they get wrong, J uh, trying to explain mm -hmm. gravitational lensing to a crowd. Right. Uh, and, and doing it better than Homer. Yeah. That was a trick. You know, there was, uh, I wish I could say, maybe one of your viewers knows this, but uh, there was a film, uh, an independent short film that was made a little while ago, and it was being promoted as they were purposely distributing it on BitTorrent. And it was a little science fiction thing, and I downloaded it, and I go, oh, cool, this is a legal BitTorrent download. And right. in the very beginning, as they came in on this lab door, it said it was the Department of Astrology. And when I saw that, I was like, 
please don't, please don't. And then the way the scene played out, they meant astronomy. And it was like, they totally ruined it completely. It's like, seriously, you made a film with with science and science fiction in it, and you don't know the difference, and you put astrology on the door. When they opened the yeah. door, was it just a bunch of people reading their horoscope? <laughs> it wasn't. I was like, I was trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. I was like, maybe they do mean astrology. Maybe they mean astrology. But there was no hint of it. They meant astronomy. And that was very disappointing. M L. BS. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, people in the chat room get it. We have um, Damage. He says he tinkers. It could be a female. It's Damage. I have no sex there, right? Right. I tinker with a tr- electronics, says Damage. Um, we have Lil Hamlet. She says Twist, DKSH, The Internet. Mm-hmm. Pioneer One. That I believe that was the film. Thank you. Pioneer One. Excellent. Um, we also have... Gord McLeod saying he participates in the other show uh, and sends all sorts of incredible stories he comes across every day, and it's true, which is This Week in Science. Gord sends me stories a lot for that. It's fantastic. Valvi says, I'm a Republican. I don't believe in science. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which, but science believes in you. Science believes in you. You will always believe in them. There's no <laughs> belief. It's not belief. There's empirical evidence that you exist <laughs> because of science. <laughs> Uh, Jert425 says, I celebrate science by letting my cheese get extra moldy and then I serve it to people. (laughs) Oh, and I grow a coffee tree at my desk here at work. Uh, Tom Terrific says, I like watching Nova. Web9174 says, they check to see daily if the mountains turn blue on silver bullets. Coors Coors cans. I don't think so. That's a good... No. Anyway. Because you need your can to tell you when it's cold. When it's cold, exactly. Because you don't have a hand to do that for you. <laughs> Zem says, Machine Project in Los Angeles often has interesting science events that are very comfortable and open. Um, Eric Duckman says, <laughs> he celebrates by having an ongoing metabolism. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> That's very important. Um, who else do we have? Um, Loquacious One enjoys op- ocean science and space science. Um Oh, Hartley celebrates science by listening to me. Thank you. Uh, Westlight watches the Big Bang Theory, which is very scientifically accurate. They actually have a physicist on set to make sure things are are right. Any science storytellers out there? That's like my new burgeoning favorite. Yes, science storytelling. I love it. And uh, there's so many groups that actually are now uh, organizing their storytelling nights around scientific themes. So I've seen one recently all on failure. And what what better oh, theme to fabulous. science than, than failure? And I've seen one uh, I've seen ones on uh, on the theme of experiment, and just all of those uh, those sort of common humanistic elements, just done in a storytelling way. I mean, it's it's the the core of Radio Lab, and, yep. and the reason that I listen Radio to that Lab's show amazing. every yeah. week is that storytelling element. So, uh, that's if I had a, an ability, that's what I would do. I would yeah. I would tell stories about science. I that's what that's I've actually wanted to do that for a long time. I, I, I realize that um, sometimes my act is very jokey. Some stuff's more conversational and some is very short little jokes. And I thought I should tell more stories and I should tell science stories and I should tell stories about there's people, scientists we know, but most people don't realize why we should know them. Most people don't really realize why we should know who Stephen Hawking is mm-hmm. or Einstein or Newton. Not when you get down to specifics. And what if I could tell a very fun, tell their story, make it funny? Mm-hmm. Um, because humor is a way to get people yeah. uh, to engage them and get them interested in the story. Exactly. Though I haven't seen, yet seen somebody on the the chat mention celebrating science through T-shirts, which is how most <laughs> of the internet seen, celebrates. Science. Haven't seen it. No T-shirts or cupcakes. 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 A way to celebrate science, a chemistry. Way to, a way to celebrate science and chemistry. Nutrition? And I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's nutrition in here. I'm sure there's milk products and carbohydrates and fat. There's Glucose carbon, yes. and stuff. We need fuel. We have sugars, fats. Yeah, all, all of that stuff. All the major food groups are, it's not a meat cupcake. Look, no, it's, it's, not, it's not a meat <laughs> cupcake. Anyway, uh, we are at, at the end of the end of the hour, so we're going to need to wrap it up. But I'm very glad to see that there are all sorts of all sorts of cele- science-celebrating people out in our chat room. And I hope there are 
science celebrating people everywhere and beyond because the celebration needs to go on past episode 100 because it's not the end. It is just the beginning. Yes. yes Congratulations like, on 100. Yay. Yeah, Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. So for everyone... Uh, Are you still in a taxi, darling? <laughs> I think she's out no, of the taxi. No, 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 but I already checked in, went through, you, you wouldn't believe all that I just did. <laughs> <laughs> she's been through security. Too bad she wasn't fine. Skyping on her iPhone <laughs> showing us the whole thing. I know. So, I'm in the plane now, talking to you legally. <laughs> Darlene, can you uh, tell us again where people can visit uh, to find out more information about the things you've been talking about the past hour? Sure, sure. ScienceCheerleader.com. Um, scienceforcitizens.net is where you can find out about lots and lots of different citizen science opportunities. And if you are involved in a production of science or new technologies um, or want to get involved in the technolo technology assessment aspects, you should go to ECAST, E-C-A-S-T, network.org to sign on to learn more about that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and people can follow you on Twitter at, at SciCheer, right? That's exactly right. SCI Cheer. So if you would like to follow Darlene and find out about things she's interested in, things that she's doing, that's where you need to go. Kishore. BayAreaScience.org backslash festival for all the information about the Bay Area Science Festival. It's 100 events over 10 days. I'm trying to cram even more science into it. Uh, so it's just a science overload week. There's programs in school, after school, late at night, early in the morning in bars. Uh, Lots of bars with beer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go to the website. Enjoy. If you don't live in the Bay Area, sciencefestivals.org. Uh, has a map of all the science festivals that are popping up across the country. There's 30 launching in the next 12 months. Wow. In the nation. wow. This is a huge movement. It's We're amazing. not even talking about the international movement, which has hundreds of science festivals across the globe. Uh, so go out and celebrate. Absolutely. Thank you. And you, you are Science Quiche on yeah. Twitter. Q-U-I-C-H-E. Thank you. So if you want to follow Like Kishore. Quiche. Like, like exactly Quiche. like Quiche. <laughs> yes. But not like Kishore. And Brian. Brian, I'm Science Comedian on everything on Twitter and YouTube and ScienceComedian.com is the website. Um, and, you know, I'm doing a lot of the, I'm involved in the science. I'm going to hopefully participate, as you are, as I will uh, be as in the well. Bay Area Science Festival. And, uh, and I've participated in a few others, and I hope to do some more. Um, yeah, that's it. Science Comedian, you can find me. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, everybody, for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I sure had a lot of fun. We've covered a lot of ground from celeb it's a, it's a good celebration and there's more celebrating to do nerds nerds Yay. awesome go science go, go science go science Yay. happy travels do... darlene we needed a professional cheerleader <laughs> that's to right exactly. <laughs> go, go science, science. <laughs> i'm dr kiki and this has been the science hour you can Catch past episodes of the Science Hour at twit.tv forward slash kiki. You can find this show up on YouTube as well. There are video episodes posted up there on the, through the Twit account on YouTube. And you can also find me if you just look for me as Dr. Kiki. I'm, I'm all over the internets, spreading the science celebration all over the internets. I hope that you join us again next week. We will be discussing the Kepler mission and searching for extrasolar planets. I think it's going to be a, a lot of fun. We're going to be talking with a NASA scientist. Um, and until then, I think that about does it. That, that kills an hour. And I do hope that this hour made your world a whole lot more interesting. Thanks, everybody. Let's go celebrate.